Thank you, Lee. You notice a lot of the songs and the hymns and what Lee was just singing is talking about hope. Hope. I've been grappling with hope this past week as I'm preparing for this uh, sermon series. And as you can see, it's entitled, The Believer's Hope. The hope of all believers. You know, we believe our hope is, is, is for eternal life rather than eternal death and eternal punishment. We hope for eternal life. But, but, but our hope for our eternity is more than just for life. It, it's, it's for, our hope is being for all eternity with life itself, which is Jesus. Jesus told us He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Himself said that He is the resurrection in the life. And when we look at our Christian hope, our Christian hope is based squarely on the resurrection of Jesus. Our Christian hope is not mere wishing or relying on our eternal lucky stars. Christian hope is in God Himself, who throughout the ages have proven to be faithful over and over and over again. The biblical hope is a hope in what God will do in the future. And at the heart of Christian hope is the resurrection of Jesus. And we understand the death of Jesus. We understand, you know, his death on the cross atoned for my sins. But without the resurrection of Jesus, Christianity would be just simply another dead religion, no different from all the other belief systems in the world. Muhammad is dead. Confucius is dead. Buddha is dead. But I like uh, this hymn, came to my mind after Lee had picked the songs for our service today. But uh, the hymn that goes, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hands of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. If Lee was preaching this, he'd be singing it. <clears throat> There's a reason why I'm not singing. You see, hope is an encouragement to the believer. And it is our, and it is our encouragement in the midst of suffering. But it also prevents the believers from being content with the present circumstances. Hope insists that Christians wait with eager longing for that great day when all of God's promise, all of His promises are fulfilled. Read an interesting story about D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, if you will, was the Billy Graham of the late 1800s. And, and, Bill, and, and D.L. Moody, in his younger days after he was called to the ministry, he was called upon to preach a funeral service. And, and so being the astute uh, uh, new minister that he was, he went through the Bible and he says, I'll just pick out one of the sermons of Jesus. And he went through all the four Gospels, searching diligently for a funeral message that Jesus may have preached. If Jesus preached it, it's good enough for him. But he searched in vain. Because it's interesting... Every time Jesus showed up at a funeral, life happened. People came to life. You see, death cannot exist where he is. And, and, and when the dead heard his voice, they sprang to life. Between now and Easter, and I have to admit, uh, Easter... Actually, if you understand the word Easter, Easter is actually a pagan word that we put on our holiday. 
but more correctly called between now and Resurrection Day, Resurrection Day, we're going to be exploring 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And here, the Apostle Paul outlines the gospel itself and examines the resurrection of Jesus. For there were those in those days that said there is no resurrection of the dead. Our sermon title today, Proof of the Resurrection, we're going to look at the first 11 verses in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. If you would turn to it in your Bibles now. We're going to be looking at the first 11 uh, verses and we're going to be talking about the proof of the resurrection. There's a lot there, but we're going to look specifically at the proof. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which, you, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance that uh, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and after that He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, in his grace towards me did not prove vain, but I labor even all the more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come and we look at the resurrection of Jesus, may we begin to comprehend how important that it is. And Lord, that because Jesus rose from the grave, we know that one day we will rise to be with you. Lord, we ask for you to move in our midst today. We ask that you touch our hearts and touch our understanding as we examine this scripture. Lord, move among us, touch us, may we feel your presence, and may Jesus be glorified. For we pray all of these in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we go through the scripture, of all the things that are recorded in the Bible, there are three things that stand out that are hotly contested by non-believers, especially those in the world of science. How many of you all seen the science in the Bible that I did? It's been almost four years ago. I want to do it again uh, someday soon. But uh, the first of these that's contested in the scriptures is the six days of creation. And in fact, if we interpret the uh, scriptures literally, we come to find out that according to the scriptures, we have an earth that's about a little over 6,000 years old, not the 4.5 billion touted by science today. And believe it or not, there's a lot of evidence to that fact as well, scientific evidence. Six days of literal creation. The second thing is the universal flood of Noah. According to scripture, that was approximately 4,400 years ago. They hotly contest the universal flood, how the waters covered the entire earth. That is very much contested in science today. But yet, I believe the Bible. 
The third thing is the physical and bodily resurrection of Jesus. That is the third thing that is hotly contested. And I talked about these in Science and the Bible, but the, the fact is, Jesus did rise from the dead bodily. Not just a spiritual, not just a metaphor, not just a figure of speech. He rose in bodily form from the dead. In April 2002, the well-respected Oxford University uh, philosophy professor Richard uh, Swinburne, he used a broadly accepted probability theory to defend the truth of Christ's resurrection. And he did it at a high-profile gathering of philosophy professors at Yale University. And he goes on to say, he says, for someone dead for 36 hours to come to life again is according to the laws of nature, extremely improbable. Swinburne goes on to say, but if there is a God of the traditional kind, natural laws only operate because he makes them operate. And Swinburne, using Bayes' theorem to assign values to things like the probability, the probability of God being real, Jesus' behavior during his lifetime, the quality of witnesses, of witness testimony after Jesus' death, and he plugged in all the numbers into a probability formula and he added them up. And the result was a 97% probability that the resurrection really occurred. You know, there's a lot of things in the world today with probabilities of less than 50% that they say that's uh, really happened. I won't get into that. But today, we're going to examine the proof of the resurrection as Paul outlines in these first 11 verses of chapter 15 that we had just read. Chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, he says, I make known to you, brethren, He's writing, he's, he's, he's writing to the church in Corinth. And apparently the question had come up. And he says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which I also received, and which you also stand, by which, you, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Paul declared the gospel to the church in Corinth. And it is on this gospel, which he'll outline it completely in the following verses, but it is that gospel which they make their stand. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his, his death, burial, and resurrection on which we stand, on which our whole faith depends. And he begins to give the gospel again. And this is not a new gospel. They have heard it before. And the gospel is unchanging. It is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. But Paul proceeds to give them four different proofs of the resurrection. Proof to reinforce their holding fast. And proof number one, proof number one is, he says, by which you are also saved. Their salvation is proof of the resurrection. Understand, when we have salvation, when we come and, and we have Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit comes within us, over in Romans 8 verse 16, Paul writes, he says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Understand, we have the proof of God's Holy Spirit within us, testifying to us that yes, it is real. And our salvation is based upon the death, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And because we have the Spirit of God, we bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus has entrusted and given us the responsibility of giving this life-giving message to the world. Acts 1.8, you know this verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
that same Holy Spirit that we have within us. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. This same Holy Spirit will give us the power to be Jesus' witnesses to the world. And we're not a witness for a dead man. You see, if this is the, the gospel, they are told to hold fast to the word. Uh, I, I like it where he says, he says, if you hold fast, that big word if here. You, you see, the world wants to take it away. It's interesting, I went back into Matthew, uh, I believe it's chapter 13, where Jesus has the parable of the sower, and it talks about sowing the word, and the word will take it away, or weeds will choke it out, and goes on and on. But you see, many people believe, but few hold fast. If a person falls away from the gospel, it is questionable whether they ever truly believe the whole gospel to begin with. There is no such thing as a temporary faith or a temporary commitment. In context, and in fact, if we put this in context with the rest of the uh, chapter 15 here, uh, we, we come to realize that there were some who said there is no resurrection of the dead. There are those who believe Jesus died. Yes, they may even believe that he died for our sins but they deny the resurrection. And you see, if you deny the resurrection, you're denying the gospel. And your faith is in vain. Because here's the gospel, the whole gospel. Verses 3 and 4. Paul outlines it. He says, For I deliver to you as of first importance, or most importance, if you will, of, as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died, according to, uh, died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. You see, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the whole gospel. You take one of it away, one of those three elements away, and it's no longer the gospel. It is no longer the gospel. You can't take part of it away and still have it stand. And, 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 and he outlines here, proof number two. Proof number two is according to the scripture. It's so important that he mentions it twice. According to the scriptures. You see, Paul didn't make this stuff up. It was part of the first century confession of faith. As they confessed their faith, Christ died and was buried according to the scripture. And he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. You see, we must always refer to the scriptures in all matters of faith. And the Old Testament scriptures are very clear. Jesus suffered for our sins on the cross. Uh, I'm, I'm only going to list just a couple of them here just now, uh, today. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. And he says, But he was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He suffered and died for our sins. This prophecy was made about 700 years before it actually happened. And it was clear by Scripture, this passage and others, that Jesus, what Jesus did for us on the cross, and it was accurately portrayed in many different Old Testament passages. Isaiah 53 verse 9, it says, His grave was assigned with wicked men, and yet he was a rich man in his death. Yeah, we, we know the story of his crucifixion. He hung on the cross between two thieves. But he was buried in a tomb. And you have to understand, only rich folks, the well-to-do, had tombs. And he was with the rich in his death. The fact that Jesus was buried assures his death. And we need to understand, without getting into particulars here, that uh, the Romans had crucifixion down to a gruesome art form. They knew death. 
And when they said Jesus died, there was beyond any doubt that he was dead. So, so goes the swooning theory, if you will. Jesus just didn't swoon in, in the coolness of the tomb. He was revived. Jesus was dead as a doornail. He was dead. He died. The Romans knew death. And then we have the report of the eyewitnesses of his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 to 7. Oh, let me back up a second. Psalm 16, 9 through 11, talking about his resurrection. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh will, all, will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. In other words, he wasn't uh, in the grave long enough for his flesh to rot off. He won't allow his flesh to decay. We have the Old Testament witness of Jesus' death and resurrection. But we also have the report of eyewitnesses that were there. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 and 7. It says, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is uh, Peter, if you will, he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at once, at one time. Most of whom remain until now, but some had fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Proof number three is that he appeared. Three times he said he appeared. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to more than 500. He appeared to James and all the apostles. He appeared. Interesting that we list Peter here first. Peter was the one who denied him. But yet Peter was the first of the apostles to see Jesus. Isn't that interesting? There, there's more compelling reasons of the truth of the gospel uh, that, that, that Paul didn't mention here. It's interesting, if you go through all four gospel, who were the first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection? The women. The women were. The women were. It's interesting. You see, a good Jewish writer who is making this stuff up, if, if, if they were to make it up, if you will, they would never list the women being the first. Why? Women in that date and time, right, wrong, or otherwise, it's just the way it was, women in that time were not considered credible witnesses. But yet all three of the gospel writers written that it was a woman. They wouldn't have listed it unless it was so. Unless it was so. It had credit. Do you understand the women being the witnesses add credibility to the written record that we have? Then Peter saw Jesus, then the rest of the disciples. And we found out that even Thomas saw him eventually. And as James read, you know, uh, he saw and he believed, and Jesus says, blessed are those who haven't seen. We haven't seen, but blessed are those who believe anyway. And then Peter says over 500 saw Jesus at the same time. We don't know what that event was, but over 500 saw. And, and, and he says, by the time this letter was written, this letter to the Corinthians, which was probably written 20, 25 years later, he says, most of them are still around. If you don't believe me, ask them. And he says, some have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep is a nice term that the Bible uses for those in the faith, not everybody else, but those that have fallen asleep are those who had died in the Lord. And, and sleep says it's just a temporary thing. More on that later, but uh, we'll talk about that. And then we come up to proof number four in verse eight. And, Peter, and Paul says, and last of all, as to one, born, uh, one untimely born, interesting word, untimely born, that's also the word in the Greek that we use for an abortion or an early birth or an abnormal birth. One abnormally born, he, Jesus, appeared to me, being Paul, also. Paul 
saw the resurrected Lord firsthand, starting on the Damascus Road at his conversion, and we have indications that he's seen him later as well. Paul saw the risen Lord. And why did Paul say this? Verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. We know the story in the first few chapters of, uh, of Acts, how he persecuted, how he stood approving at the uh, stoning of Stephen. We, we know about these things. But yet God called him. Verses 10 and 11. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me did not prove vain. But I labored even, even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it, it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. Paul, by God's grace and great mercy, was called from one working against God to working for God. I look at God's call on my life. God didn't call me because of who I am. He called me in spite of who I am. He didn't call me because of who I am. He called me because of who he is. It's all about Jesus. And we look at the example of Paul and how he traveled more, arguably more persecuted than the others. Uh, most all the others except for, uh, uh, except for John were, uh, were martyred, according to church uh, legends and other stories. But he, was, he worked harder, traveled more, more persecuted, and why? Out of gratitude of what God, through Jesus, had done for him. His motivation completely changed. Letter to the Philippians 3.10, he writes, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the bottom line is, is in verse 11, he says, whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. It's not about the messenger. It's all about the message. It's all about the message. Jesus, him crucified and risen from the dead. The message... We may not have been eyewitnesses, but for those of us who are saved, proof number one, we have the witness of God's Spirit with our spirit. Number two, we have the witness of the Old Testament prophecies. They told about what Jesus was going to go through, his death, burial, and resurrection, hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. Proof number three is we have the witnesses of the apostles and over 500 others. Think about the apostles a second. They all, except for John, I mentioned, were martyred. Would you die for a lie? Think about it. Would you die for a lie? Would they be put to death torturously, crucified and otherwise, for a lie? We have the witnesses of the apostles and over 500 others. And then number four, we have the witness of Paul himself. Of Paul himself, who was one who persecuted the church and God called him to be one of the big greatest church planners of all time. And Paul, who saw the Lord after his ascension into heaven, and you got to remember, Paul wrote over half of the New Testament. He wrote more than any other. If we have God's witness his spirit living within us, and we have the gospel with the world that the world needs, are we passing it on or are we keeping it to ourselves? I had someone tell me once, you know, they're <clears throat> not to push them on their faith because their faith is a personal thing. God didn't call for our faith to be very personal and close held, it's to be very public. There's no secret agents for God. 
And there are those who will, even today, continually ask proof for the resurrection. And they'll ask, how do we know that he lives? Let me finish that hymn, Lee. The chorus goes, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? How does the rest go? He lives within my heart. That's all the proof I need. Does he live within your heart? Do you have the proof of the spirit of the living Christ living within you? Yes, Jesus did rise from the dead. That is our Christian hope because he rose. And as we will read later on in this chapter, I know one day I will rise. The, uh, Paul goes on to say he's just merely the first fruits of those that will rise. It's also interesting in Scripture, and I'm getting off the subject here a little bit, but Scripture is very clear. One day everyone will rise. And Revelation talks about two resurrections. And may we be part of the first, because the second resurrection is the resurrection of judgment. May we be part of the first resurrection and forever be with life itself, Jesus. Do you have Jesus within you today? Do you have the proof that he is alive? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up this word and the witnesses of your word and the evidence of, of your spirit speaking to our spirit. Lord, as we feel this, may we not hold it to ourselves and may we tell a lost world about it. Lord, I pray today that if there's someone online listening to this live stream or hear the recording later, Lord, if there's someone in here in this place today that does not know the risen Savior, does not know the risen Lord Jesus, Lord, that they'll come to a saving knowledge of Him today and take Your Spirit within themselves. Lord, we're asking for You to draw uh, people to Yourselves today. For your word tells us that you're not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Move among us today. Lord, may we be renewed in these things that we've read today. And that we'll be empowered to give your word to a lost world that needs to hear it. Touch us today. Move among us. May Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.